Hello friends, in this chapter we will be learning about comparative development experiences of India and its neighbor that is China and Pakistan. So after completion of this chapter you will be able to know about the comparative trends in various economic and human development indicators of India and its neighbors. You will also come to know about the various strategies that these, con though, that these countries have adopted to reach their present state of development. So these, so nowadays the nations, in order to strengthen their power, to stre uh, to strengthen their economies, they are forming the regional and global economic grouping, such as SARC, EU, or ASEAN or BRICS. That uh, you have to understand this. That in 21st century or in today's era, there is more need of economic cooperation and the economy which has better economy are the uh, much more better countries than the countries those have better military system or the political system. So the strengthening or coming up of the new economic zones or economic uh, uh, regional cooperation groups is uh, a big indicator for the uh, indicator for the importance of economic uh, unions. So this is one and now we will be talking about the developmental path of the three countries. As we know India and uh, Pakistan and uh, China, the People's Republic of China, all the three countries ha are got independent at the same period almost 1947, 1947 and uh, China 1949. These countries have understood in a very early stage that there will be a need of uh, planning, a systematic planning for developing their economies. So India has ad adopted a five-year plan system where the first five-year plan was introduced in 1951 and Pakistan first five-year plan 1956 and China's first five-year plan 1953. So the first common thing in three neighbors is their uh, five-year plans. And the second I would say the another one common thing in the three countries is the almost same time at the same time they got independent 1947 and the China 1949 so their developmental path started almost in the same period so uh, all the three nations have started towards their developmental path at the same time and uh, uh, India and Pakistan adopted similar strategies like India and Pakistan they have created a large public sector because there was no incentive in uh, uh, incentive for the private players to invest so government has to come forward and uh, then government has to establish large public sector setup or the public sector undertakings in India uh, so to raise the public expenditure and they have done a lot of public uh, expenditure for the social development this you need to understand. Moving forward, so China. So China has come up with few strategies or reforms. In that, the first thing you, you must understand where India and Pakistan, their political system is different, whereas the Chinese political system, is a, all the three are democracies, the Asia's uh, big democracies but uh, China uh, democracy is like there is a single party system uh, under one party rule and uh, another thing is is, is a basically communist country where uh, is a, no capitalism means all the 
sources of production or all the means of productions are in the hands of the government the all the sectors of economy enterprises land everything is operated by the government control this is the important thing and a unique feature uh, when you compare with india and uh, pakistan so the first thing china has introduced that is great leap forward this campaign was initiated in 1958 and the main aim of the this campaign was rapid industrialization in the country so they wanted to do industrialization and uh, on a large scale on a massive scale the industries should be encouraged to set up and even uh, there is a sentence in the book like people were encouraged to set up industries in their backyard kahi wherever you get place you just set up a uh, small small industry and cottage industry or the assembling units so that uh, the people or the manpower can um, can be utilized that is the idea behind <coughs> so in rural area china has uh, taken all the land and it was uh, divided into commune system where coming under the commune system the people collectively people will collectively cultivate the land yes not like uh, this is my plot and i will cultivate and this is my plot individuals like what we do in india no it was like uh, the whole land was uh, divided into 26000 communes and people were employed on this as the farmers and the responsibility was given to them that this piece of land and uh, we want this much uh, yield or the production from this land so under commune system people collectively cultivated the land and there were 26000 communes or covering almost all the farm population of uh, china so this is the first strategy and uh, you must know one more thing here <clears throat> that china uh strategies these this glf campaign uh, met with so many problems the first problem was a very severe very havoc uh drought came in china and which has caused the death of 30 million people is a very big toll 30 million people died in this drought <coughs> and the second thing that uh, when russia had conflict with china then uh, china had to withdraw its professionals who had earlier been sent in 1965 by uh, mao like the other important reform done by china is great proletarian cultural revolution which was started by mao in 1966 76 so here mao wanted that his young professionals and students should uh, go to the remote areas of china and they should learn from the culture and uh, what are the best practices happening there in the rural area of china at the same time the young generation will come to know about the best practices uh, continued in their areas so that is the another reform and they um, through this the main principle or the idea behind this this uh, initiative was that they, the young generation and the students and the professional should have a belongingness and uh, identity with their culture so china's present rapid industrialization growth can be traced back to its reforms in 1978 china also started the reforms in a phased manner so there was two phases in the initial phase there were reforms initiated in agriculture sector investment sector and foreign sector and uh, for example in agriculture commune land were divided into small plots which were allocated back to the individuals that is one thing and uh, in the another phase 
So in the later phase, the reforms were initiated in the industrial sector, where the private sector firms in general and the township and the village enterprises, uh, those enterprises which were owned and operated by the local collectives, in particular were allowed to produce goods. China has also come up with the new idea of state-owned enterprises, and uh, uh, which we, which we in India we call it public sector enterprises. Similarly, in China, there was a state-owned enterprises, and which have come forward for production of goods and services. China has also made the special economic zones, uh, where uh, were set up to attract the foreign investors. So as we know that foreign direct investment is uh, a push to the economy and uh, it has a very signif significant role in development of any economy. So China in way back in 1978, they have thought about this and uh, started the economic zones to attract the foreign investors while the reform increased the production massively and the sufficient surplus generated. So once the industrial growth is done, uh, special economic zones are set up and the foreign investment has come. So altogether it has resulted in production of massive uh, goods and services and this sufficient surplus generated by this increased production and the proportion of goods in market fueled the modernization of the mainland Chinese economy. So this all together has resulted in the modernization of Chinese economy. So this is the about China and uh, after this reform China built their state owned enterprises to compete with the local sector, to compete with local sector. Farmers and industrial units had to buy or sell, had to buy or sell a fixed amount of input and output at the fixed prices. So this is here another reform which is known as dual pricing system. So under this dual pricing, this means that fixing the prices in two ways. Farmers and industrial units were required to buy and sell fixed quantities of input and output on the basis of price fixed by the government. And the rest people, apart from the farmers and the industrial units, the rest were purchased and sold at the market prices. So two different prices are there, one for the production and consumption and another one the price that will be decided by the market forces, demand and supply. So these are the uh, reforms done by China. Now moving forward we will talk about the Pakistan, our immediate neighbor. The policies of Pakistan and India show striking similarities as we in the, in the beginning we spoke about it that uh, both have started their developmental strategy together, both have done huge investment in public sector. So Pakistan focused on coexistence of public and private sector and it is also a mixed economy like India. <coughs> So in the late 1950s and 60s, uh, Pakistan introduced a variety of regulated policy framework, regulated policy framework for the import substitution based industrialization. The policy combined tariff protection for the manufacturing of consumer goods together with direct import control on the competing imports. So uh, this is the first step for uh, the Pakistan economy that regulated policy framework and then trade substitution framework as well as comp so that their local firms can compete with the foreign goods. So this is the one. The another one is the green revolution. The introduction of green revolution led to mechanization and increase in the public investment in infrastructure in the selected areas which finally led to rise in the production of food grains and this is this has changed the entire agrarian structure dramatically in Pakistan. So this is the another one and uh, the third important thing happened in Pakistan in 1970s nationalization of capital good industries took place. Pakistan then shifted its policy 
orientation in 1970s and 1980s when the major thrust over areas were denationalization de and encouragement of the private sector so first here i just want to speak um, first china uh, sorry pakistan has uh, introduced nationalization policy nationalizing the entire banking units in 1969 and very in a very short period they realized that it is not a good idea government has to do a lot of expenditure in nationalization so they have immediately revert roll back the uh, this their decision and immediately 1970s they have uh, reintroduced the nationalization of capital good industries so this is one another one another important thing happened in pakistan received because pakistani economy receives a good amount of financial support from the western nations which was a major part of the stimulating the economic growth so a lot of uh, remittances from foreign countries come in pakistan and which incentive um, offer were marketed to increase the private sector growth and this led to an increase in the foreign and local investment the year 1988 witnessed various reforms that were initiated in the country so the government at the time also offered incentives to the private sector and all this created a conducive climate for the new investments so this is about pakistan and then uh, we will move forward and talk about comparative studies in which we will take the demographic indicators gross domestic product and the sectors which are uh, uh, contributing in the gdp of their uh, of these three nations and the human development indicators the socio economic indicators of development of these countries so demographic indicators demographic demo means the population related indicators so pakistan population is only 1/10th of the india and china's population even though the china is the largest nation it has the lowest density among these three countries because availability of lot of land so and the population growth in the pakistan is highest and then india and in the last it comes for china so we can how we will just quickly analyze this uh, table uh, set of data is given where you can see that china has the highest population closely china has the highest population and uh, which is about 1371 million people whereas uh, the india has 1352 million people and uh, uh, pakistan has only 212 people 212 million people demographic indicators so as we know that pakistan is a small country and it has uh, in comparison to india and uh, china it is a small country and uh, it has only the 1/10th population of uh, india or china even though china is the largest nation it uh, has the lowest density because availability of a uh, lot of land the total size of china is almost three times the size of india so a big geographical land they have and population growth is highest in pakistan then in india and then the last comes china so demographic indicators all about the population of uh, the three countries so we can see that in the estimated population in millions india has about 1352 million people whereas the china has 1393 people as per the uh, 2017 and 18 uh, data and pakistan has only 212 million people talking about the annual growth of population which is about 1.03% of india and only 0.46% of china and in this pakistan is 2.05% again coming to the density means how many people reside in per kilometer uh, area of india china and pakistan so in india 
which is relevantly higher than the rest of the two countries, 455 people, and uh, in China, uh, 148 person in per square kilometer, whereas it is 275 people in in regard to Pakistan. Talking about gender ratio, the gender ratio China is pretty good, which is 949, means uh, availability of female on every thousand male people so on the female candidates are 949 and uh, in India it is 924 whereas it is 943 in case of Pakistan talking about the fertility rate it is uh, highest in Pakistan which is 3.6 people 3.6 children per family so how many members are there in per family uh, so it is 3.6 for the Pakistan and 2.2 for India and it is only 1.7 for China here you should note that China has adopted a one child policy norm which is introduced late in 1970s and uh, that is the major reason for the low population growth in China this one child norm also led to the decline in the sex ratio and uh, the sex ratio is low and biased against the female in all the three countries preference of for son that is prevailing in all these three countries and that is the reason that sex ratio is less than thousand the another one is urbanization which talks about the uh, how much uh, development of the cities and cemented road infrastructure that uh, urbanization of the area in this China is 59 percent and uh, Pakistan 37 percent and India uh, has to travel a long way the 34 percent so this is about the demographic indicators of these three countries uh, so then the next important indicator is the GDP and the sectors so this GDP and the sectors so here the sectors are divided three sectors primary secondary tertiary sector where um, yeah. India Pakistan and China that how many what is the uh, population included here just a minute so now we can see here the GDP and employment of these three countries where we can see the primary sector, secondary sector and tertiary sector. So in India 17% of the GDP share comes from agriculture sector or the primary sector whereas the 30% of the share comes from the contribution in GDP comes from secondary sector and the large uh, portion is uh, is supplied or coming from the tertiary sector which is 53 percent similarly in Pakistan also the we can see all the three countries have done significantly good in the tertiary sector and uh, in Pakistan 54 percent uh, of the contribution in GDP comes from tertiary sector and 21 percent from the manufacturing and secondary sector and 25 percent of the GDP is contributed by the primary sector moving forward to see the Chinese economy whereas only 9% of the contribution is from primary sector and uh, they have successfully they are gaining or taking a lot of contribution from the secondary sector manufacturing sector as we know that China has covered uh, vast areas in terms of exports and uh, they have a very strong base industrial base and uh, uh, they have very strong uh, output in manufacturing sector also so 43 percent of the GDP contribution comes from secondary sector and 48 percent from the tertiary sector one more interesting thing here we should know that that there is 42 percent uh, employment in China is uh, uh, 42 percent 42.7 percent employment is from the primary sector this the workforce this is the portion of workforce uh, there in India 42 percent people engaged in the primary sector and their contribution is 17 percent 
so which is which clearly reflects that we have to improve a lot in this area a lot of disguise and employment a lot of uh, technological upgradation and investment has to incurred in this sector and in india there is 23% people engaged in the secondary sector and the contribution is 30% of the gdp and one more interesting thing is only 33% of the workforce is engaged in the tertiary sector and their contribution is 53% so this is the sector is emerging as a very strong uh, stable more stable sector of the economy moving uh, then to pakistan 42% of the population is engaged in the primary activities and the contribution in gdp is 25% and then 3.7% only this much very thin percentage of the workforce in, is there in the secondary sector and the uh, their output is 21% <coughs> whereas 54% people are engaged in the tertiary sector and 54% is the output or the contribution in gdp the china china has uh, uh, 17% people 17.5% workforce engage in the primary sector and they give 9% of 9% uh, contribution and then 9% contribution in the economy and then 26% people are engaged in the secondary sector whereas the their contribution is 43% in the economy and uh, here uh, 56% people are engaged or getting job employment in the tertiary sector and uh, their contribution is around 48% in the economy so this is the gdp and employment of these three countries so in terms of the land use and agriculture we can see that china has the second largest gdp and uh, it has about 19.37 trillion the value of the gdp while india's gdp is about 3.75 trillion and the pakistan has a gdp of size about 1.28 so china is having the largest market size in as per the gdp values among these three countries india was the india was at the bottom of the gdp growth until 1980s while so china has the second largest gdp which is 19.37 trillion and while the india has a gdp size of 3.75 trillion and pakistan has a gdp size market size of uh, 1.28 usd dollar trillion india was the bottom of gdp growth until 1980s while china maintained a double digit growth uh, for over a decade that is the reason that china has uh, overpaced their neighboring countries today and is standing much more ahead than india and pakistan so then pakistan gdp uh, dunked below 4% due to the political instability and uh, the, the reforms took place in 1988 so political instability is one of the important uh, feature here for pakistan whereas the other two countries india and uh, china did not face such problem and uh, china was able to maintain near the double digit growth during 1980s so we can see here the industrial growth of china india and pakistan so the countries like china the industrial growth of china in 1980s was Uh, about 10.3 percent, whereas the both the countries' uh, industrial growth was almost half of the China, which is India's 5.7 percent, and whereas the Pakistan uh, industrial growth was only 6.3 percent. Whereas if you compare after uh, 30 or 35 years from 1980s, then India's the industrial growth is about 7.3 percent, which is much more better than the previous one and whereas the china is now uh, is uh, declined from the double digit to 6.8% as but it is still uh, very huge because the volume of the industry and the volume size has also increased multiple times so 6.8% of that huge volume matters a lot 
and whereas the Pakistan from the previous growth it has come down as 5.3 percent so this is the uh, industrial growth of these countries then uh, moving ahead that uh, China size uh, of cultivable land is uh, about 40 per, uh, is land is only about 40 percent whereas in uh, 40 percent of India's after the 1980s and uh, China dropped incentivizing the agriculture and focuses efforts on handicrafts commerce and transport the workforce proportion uh, engaged in manufacturing in India and Pakistan were about 21 percent and 23 percent and the industry industries contributed to GDP about 30 percent or 21 percent in Pakistan the service sector is now the emerging factor to provide GDP growth in both these countries and the growth of the agriculture sector has declined in all the three countries as they are uh, upgrading themselves in the secondary sector and more focus on the tertiary sector. The GDP of China is still double, double digit whereas the manufacturing sector has played a significant role in Chinese economy. Finally, we shall discuss about the indicators of human development in the three neighboring countries. So first of all, it is the human development index. The values, which is the maximum value is one, uh, like a, a Scandinavian countries, Luxembourg, Norway, Sweden. So now let us look about the indicators of human development in these three neighbors. The human development index, which is uh, the best number is around one like the Scandinavian countries, Norway uh, and uh, Sweden, Luxembourg. These countries stand top rank in HDI in the world and their score is nearby 9.7 or 0.97 or very close to 1. So India's score is 0.645 whereas China's score is 0.76 much better than India and the Pakistan is lagging behind as 0.5 Five, seven. We can see the same thing in terms of the rank in HDI. So India's HDI rank, Human Development uh, Index rank in the world is uh, 130th rank, uh, which, is, which cannot be considered as a very good rank. So we have to improve on the uh, components of HDI, which is uh, like the major components are education level or literacy level in the country, like uh, uh, how number of years is spent in the schools by the age group which is supposed to go in the school that is the one component and the second important is life expectancy rate is another component and the third major component is their uh, per capita income so there are some other indicators also so together when you club it we get human development index rank and the value first and then the rank and uh, so India's rank is 130th China is much better 87th rank and Pakistan followed by India 154th rank let's see the life expectancy rate in these countries so the this is the data of 2017-19 where the life expectancy rate in India is 69.7 years so average e average Indian lives for these many years then comes the China. <coughs> China, the life expectancy rate is 76.9. Uh, this is the average year the people of China live. And then Pakistan, which is 67 years, 67.3. Then comes the mean years of schooling and the age between the 15, the age of 15 and above. Then uh, they are 6.5 in India and 8.1 in China and 5.2 in Pakistan that is another one indicator then comes the gross na gross national income per capita uh, income which is at PPP uh, purchasing power parity the in US dollars so Indian purchasing power parity per capita is 6681 USD whereas the Chinese uh, people per capita purchasing power is $16,057 and Pakistan lagging behind with the 5,500, uh, 5,005 uh, US dollars as their purchasing power. 
so we shall learn more about it uh, uh, about ppp in the coming class then the percentage of the people living below poverty line which is about 22% people in india only 1.7% people in china and uh, about 24.3% people in uh, uh, pakistan so this this is the strategy and this is the condition another important very important indicator is infant mortality rate that uh, out of the per thousand live births how many p uh, infants which uh, who could not com complete the age of 1 year like 0 to 1 year and uh, they die uh, before completion of 1 year of uh, their age so it is uh, 29 uh, about 30 students 30 children uh, out of 1000 uh, live births and uh, it is only 7.4 single digit number uh for china and it is very high in pakistan so we have to still work so that we can uh, save more lives and uh, we so that our children these uh, uh, we have to eradicate the problem of malnourishment from the country so that this number or figure can be improved then the mater maternal mortality rate which talks about that how many mothers die at the time of delivery of the children so out of per lakh out of 1 lakh births 133 mothers die in india 29 mothers in china and 140 is the number in pakistan so another population using at least basic sanitary conditions though what is the rate how much population has access to the basic sanitary conditions in india 60% people and in china 75% and in pakistan it is only 60% so again we have to both india and china as well as pakistan china india and pakistan as well as china because in china it is 75 means one third people have access to basic sanitary conditions and still we have to all three neighbors have to work uh, a lot progress a lot in this field then the population using at least basic drinking water facility the potable drinking water 93% people and uh, which means that 7% people do not have access to the potable water and they are forced to drink unhealthy water then 96% people in china and uh, china have access to the basic drinking water 91% people in pakistan then the percentage of undernourished children which is a very very high number in india that is 37.9% the very big population is living uh, below uh, nourishment undernourished children so it has a very serious uh, consequences on the future citizens of the country so this case has to be taken care of then in china it is only 8.1% and pakistan again 37.6% which is quite similar to the indian number and but the total number of heads in india is much more because of the total population um, is high so these are the human capital human human development indicators in these three countries so here uh, dear students we will end up uh, our this chapter uh, hopefully you have enjoyed learning this chapter thank you so much